this. Well, last Sabbath we had the example of Gideon, and I think from your reactions we were all very, very excited to hear. Well, this, for this first day of the, of the, of the feast, I thought another good example from the Old Testament would apply of a mighty man, the mightiest man probably in the history of humankind. It's Samson, you know. Just to remind you, when Moses and Joshua died, there was a leadership vacuum in the house of Israel. And the period of time came to be known as the time of the judges, you see. And it was a dark time in Israel's history, really. The children of Israel repeatedly did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's exactly what it says about six times in the book of Judges. And these words appear, as I said, at least six times. And then, of course, later on in Judges and Chronicles, we again read how the children of Israel would just backslide. You know, after being delivered, they would just backslide again, again to the same cult and to the same paganism. This is what I'm coming to realize, as I told you already about your nation, your Anglo-Saxon nations, brethren, you're not, you're not that morally evil as like many nations of this world. But I was wondering why is God going to punish the house of Israel? But exactly, God told me, look at the pattern of their behavior. I'll deliver them. I tell them, okay, be my people, return to me. But no, the house of Israel always wants to be pagans. The house of Israel does not want to be God's people. The house of Israel just wants to be just like, like any other nations and do and serve foreign gods that I have not commanded them. So you have the same in the book of Judges. You have this acyclical pattern in the book of Judges. You know, begins with apostasy, which meaning the, ch- the children of Israel abandoning God, and that was followed by hardship brought upon by God as a form of punishment, as we have seen in the book of Gideon. Then followed by crying out to the then they remember that they nevertheless God's people. And that will happen to that 10% of the Anglo-Saxon world. You know, when the time comes, 10% of Israelites will probably remember, but look, we are God's people. What have we done in our lives? So then they come to realize that we are God's people. We need to be delivered. And then God, what does God do? He was placing a judge over them to rescue them. A judge over them to rescue them. And this is a common theme again and again and again. And we'll read the book of Judges. Now, the time of the judges, just to remind you, lasted for roughly... Three and a half centuries, 350 years, until the establishment of the monarchy, which started with Saul, then came through David, and then Solomon. So until the monarchy was established, when Israel, for the first time in its history, was really united under one crown, that happened. So the judges, the book of Judges, lasted for three and a half centuries. During the period of the judges, the Philistines were a constant thorn in the side of Israel. Egypt was no longer a power. It was the mightiest power at that time. Very mighty civilization. It was destroyed. Why? So that God will again deliver abject slaves and make out of them his nation. The Assyrians and the Babylonians were yet not in the picture. Those empires were kind of in formation. And they will play a pivotal role at much larger, uh, much uh, later time, in particular to the destruction of the house of Israel and including the Philistines. So in total... There are more than a dozen judges in the house of Israel, 13 men, and interestingly, one amazing woman. And I know you're now looking forward to hearing that message one of these days, because the story of Deborah, what a mighty, wonderful woman, is very inspirational. It shows to us how women are an incredible asset to God's church in every possible way. It took a woman, a brave woman, to tell him, look, Barak, you know, move your ass, you know, move your ass up, move all these Israelites, you know, we've got to be, we've got to be, you know, delivered and established again as a nation. So we have 13 men and one woman. A few of those judges, like Jephthah and Samson, fought the Philistines, you see. So did Eli and Samuel later. King Saul and his son Jonathan, you might remember, died at the hands of the Philistines. And of course, we all know that David, the story of David and Goliath. Do you know that uh, Goliath, just to remind you, was also a Philistine? So today I would like to talk about one judge in particular, and his name is, as you know, Samson. And I guess all of your sons would admire Samson, the mightiest man, the strongest man ever in history of humankind. We'll just, we'll just go, we're just going to review some lessons that we can learn from that book, just like we'll learn from the book of Gideon. And one of these days, as I told you on the Sabbath, I'll be able to report to my English teacher, Jerry Holcomb, Look, I remember your words. My students, I'm concerned about you because you do not really know the Old Testament stories. You cannot really draw the lessons from that. So please be mindful of that. I'm mindful of that. And we are all mindful of that now. So the story of Samson is contained in about four short chapters in the book of Judges, starting in Judges chapter 13. And we are going through. We may not read, read perhaps every possible scripture, even though I do want to do it. 
Hopefully the time will permit us to do it. So uh, if not, nevertheless, we're just going to draw out the most important lessons. Judges 13 verse 1. What do we read in verse 1? Well, of course, the same old story of the house of Israel. And the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered the children of Israel into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Your lifetime, Jamie boy. So 40 years, you know. So all, there was a generation, you see, all of their life, that generation was under capture under oppression of the Philistines rather than living free. So there is a whole new generation that didn't really know what it means to be free and to freely serve their God. And you know in those in those chapters on blessings and cursings, God says to Israel, modern Israel, because you did not want to serve me with cheerful heart in all abundance, therefore I'm going to give you over to your enemies to capture and then you will see what it is a miserable life and what it is and how it is really to be a pagan all that you wanted all of your life. Verse 5. So we also know exactly which part of the cyclical pattern the children of Israel were in when Samson came into picture. So we can just now drop to verse 5, which says, For lo, thou shalt conceive, this is angel speaking to uh, Samson's mother, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. This is now very unusual. They were Nazarites, but those vows would really last for a certain period of time. People just vow to be Nazarites, so they would just be Nazarites for five months, you know, perhaps a year, but not from the womb. You see, this is very interesting. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of Philistines. Also, he shall begin, you know, he will not really finish that process, but he shall begin. So now clearly we know by now what the real purpose why Samson was called by God, you know. We know the very reason why he was chosen, and that was to deliver the house of Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. And, uh, yeah, we can be brave, but no, let's read, let's continue to read. The story is amazing, so we are just going to be reading, reading more. Verse 6, And the woman came to the Lord, to told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his face was like the face of an angel of God. Very terrifying. But I did not ask him where he came from, neither did he tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And now now drink no wine, no strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. What does this tell us, brethren? What was Israel doing at that time? Eating unclean things. All the things that our lovely nations love to eat today. Seafoods, bacons, and so on. So you see, and who knows what else. So he told me, Don't eat unclean thing, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And uh, Man- Ma- Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God whom you send come again to us and teach us what we shall do as the boy as the boy that shall be born. Now this is interesting. You see, Manoah obviously prayed to God, so we have a family that has at least some awareness that remained, just like there is much awareness in the Anglo-Saxon world that you are God's people, nevertheless, and much awareness of what the law of God is. So we have this interesting family. By the way, there is an account that Manoah was from the tribe of Dan. You might remember the tribe of Dan was the, uh, I think, the least in number, or at least it was very, very small in number. So Danites, throughout their history, had to be very, uh, what's the word, resourceful when resisting their enemies. They had to spare, you know, their their, their men force, and they were trying to come up all these strategic partisan kind of a, 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 a warfare with their enemies. Because remember what was the uh, what was the prophecy about the tribe of Dan? He was going not to really attack the uh, the one who rides the horse. He was going to bite the horse, <laughs> you know, by the uh, by the by the leg, and then the horse would just you know fall down, and with the horse, all the rest of the of the might. So the Danites were like that, and you see through the Irish history exactly the way how they fought with the English. They were always having this partisan kind of struggle with them. So uh, verse ten, and 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 the woman so. Manoah prays to God, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her, so she now rushes to him, says, Hey, behold, a man has appeared again. And Manoah rose, went after his wife, came to the man, verse 11. Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Interestingly, I am. Huh. I am. Does that ring the bell? When Moses said, what shall I say to the children of Israel when they say, Who are you? To you know, well, just tell them I am who I am. So it's the angel of the Lord supposedly, but we 
just like in the story of the Gideon, remember? But then later we see how Gideon addresses him. He says, Lord. So, verse 12. And Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and what shall we do uh, to him? And then verse 13. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the wine, neither let her drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat on any unclean thing. Let her do all that I commanded her. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, I pray you, let us... Let us keep you until you, we have made a kid ready for you. Uh, draw the parallel. Do you remember what was Gideon's response? Oh, oh, you're really, oh, you're really the angel of the Lord. Well, you know, let, let me let me just make some food and see how you'll consume it. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Perhaps that was a test test of some kind of uh, veracity coming from God or not. But anyway, you see, in the Old Testament, the same old pattern. You know, people are called to do certain tasks, but they kind of doubt it a little bit. You know, am I really the one? Is my son really the one? You know. Verse 16, And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you keep me, I'll not eat of your bread, and if you will offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. So in this case, we see that that was really the angel, not the Lord himself. But in Gideon's case, we see Gideon said the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when you when your sayings come to pass, we may do you honor. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask after my name in this way? Yeah, it is wonderful. Whatever that means, we can just, you know, we're just left now here to let our imagination run and we can just, you know, speculate what it means. Verse 19, Manoah took a kid with a grain offering and offered it upon a rock to the Lord and the angel did wonderfully. <laughs> and Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went up toward the heaven from the, of the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground which we probably, well, we all would probably do, and we would be terrified to see something like that. But the angel of the Lord did not appear anymore, and Manoah knew that it was, that was, he was the angel of the Lord. So he proved now, that's the angel of the Lord, that's the message from the Lord, angels as messengers. And now, Manoah said to his wife, verse 22, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife, again, here's a wisdom from a, from a female, a female brain. If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and grain offering at our hand, or at our hands. Neither would he have shown, showed us all these things, nor have told us such things as these at this time. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And then of course it says, 25, that's the key verse. What was what was beginning to move that individual, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Estahol. Okay, that was chapter 13. And then we come to chapter 14, and now, of course, Samson is a lad, and the hormones are now starting to work, but also the Lord is there because he's constantly trying to lead Samson to drive the wedge between Israelites and Philistines. 40 verse 1, And Samson went down to Timoth and saw a woman at Timoth of the daughters of the Philistines. So she, he comes back home, of course, has his father and mother, and mother, mother, father and mother say, of all the women in our tribes, all the women of our nation, you want to get this strange woman, why would you do that, you know? But uh, Samson said to his father, verse 3, uh, oh, his father says, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? <laughs> and Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me very much. But the father and his mother, verse 4, did not know that it was from the Lord, you see. That he was looking, the Lord was looking for an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had rule over Israel. And then now comes the... Uh, Comes the wedding very soon. Verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, and he tore it as it would have torn a kid, because he came, he went down to Temna in verse 5, and he, uh, behold, the young lion roared at him. So, but, you know, so he leaves the lion dead, he doesn't tell his father or his mother what he has done, and he went down and talked to, with, with the woman, and she pleased Samson very much. Verse 7, well, let's keep reading the story, the story is very interesting, I mean, you'll be reminded and then we'll just review the lessons which are, but the lessons are already there, you see. 
Because then after a time he returned to her t- to take her and he turned aside to see the dead body of the lion and behold a swarm, so he is now going back to talk to her, a swarm of bees and honey was in the dead body of the lion. And he took some of it in his hands and went on his way eating and came to his father and mother. And of course he gave some of that honey for them to eat but doesn't tell them where does it come from. Isn't that interesting? Now you know that lion is not really uh, meat to be eaten. So uh, taking you know this out of lion's carcass is really questionable. And we are talking about a Nazarite, a man who is supposed to be clean and not eat unclean stuff, you see. So we are drawing, you see already the lessons there. And uh, you're becoming kind of this cursed, oh no, you know, what a wonderful, what a wonderful character, the strongest man in the world, and yet he's making such terrible mistake. Well, brethren, you're all wonderful characters in God's eyes, but we're all t- making terrible mistakes at times, right? Don't we? Uh, Judges 14.10 And his father went down to the woman and Samson made a feast there for so the young man used to do. Now as I uh, told you already and you can draw parallel with the Feast of Tabernacles the feast in, the, in, Israel, in Israel and even, to, even long after Israelites the wedding feast in the, in the house of Judah would go for seven days. And we're keeping the feast that represents the wedding of the lamb with the bride. Now, do you realize now, perhaps, why do we have seven days feast of tabernacles? You see, isn't that God's providence? Because it was very usual to make a feast, long feast, for seven days. Now, to all of you here in the Western world, it's kind of that's kind of horrifying. But to us in the Eastern world, that's kind of you. That's kind of normal thing. You know, when we feast, we feast. You know, we just have, we just go. Sometimes we just go for a long time. So you see, the Jews were like this. And there is something in Jewish culture that I always appreciate and I always kind of encourage us as believers to appreciate and that is the, in spite of all the tragedies they've gone through, you will never hear them, uh, well, when they mourn, they mourn. But when it comes to Jewish feasts and stuff, just look at, to, listen to the Jewish music. It's always upbeat, it's always full of uh, vigor, energy, life, brethren. We have to understand that we are being blessed by God regardless of all the things we have been through our lives. And that's what it is, feast. Yes, it's not wrong to be ha- to be happy, to be very happy. And to laugh very, you know, very loudly like my one of my friends from college used to laugh and his laughter would be, would be echoing all over the place <laughs> and I would be laughing with him. So, uh, be happy. And something else. When you go to a synagogue, where however important the service might be, especially the Day of Atonement, the children are, you know, the children are there playing, they're just running between the rows of those seats, and nobody cares. And nobody looks sternly at them, you know, they're kids. You know, that's something that you'll find in the Jewish, in the Jewish circles very common, that kids are regarded as blessings, and we do not expect them to behave like adults. So keep that in mind. That's a very good thing because, you know, they're God's people still, they're God's people of the Old Testament. Yes, they haven't received Jesus Christ. They have not accepted him, but nevertheless, we know they will. From the book of Zechariah, just to comfort you, for all of you who care, who care about the Jewish people, the first nation to accept Jesus Christ when he comes with repentance, according to Zechariah, is the Jewish nation. The first nation that will repent deeply and accept him will be the Jews. And then will come the other nations. Of course, there will be traumatized Israelites who survived the tribulation and we have to enter them now into the promised land. But first we have to clear up a little bit of rubbles, you know, of Jerusalem and so on. But the Jewish nation is the first one to receive Jesus Christ when he comes back. That's what I read in Zechariah. While they read all the other nations going to Armageddon to fight him, no, the Jewish nation, they've got the typical mourning ceremony, men to one side, women to the other side, and cry, for, cry and repent for what they have not accepted when the time was. So don't worry about the Jews, they'll accept Jesus Christ and don't try to convert them, of course. They'll accept Jesus Christ in their time that God has uh, determined. And now, Judges 14, 12, Samson said to, to them, to those young lads that were with him, I'll not put forth a riddle for you if you certainly tell it to me within the seven days of the feast. The seven days of the feast, have you noticed that? So wedding feast was always for seven days. And you discover its meaning, then I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put forth your riddle so that we may hear it. And of course the riddle is, the riddle is in connection with that lion and that he, you know. Out of the eaten, that's verse 14, out of the eater came forth food (laughs) and out of the strong came forth sweetness. What a riddle, you know, nobody could get it, of course. And in three days, 
they were not able to declare the meaning of the riddle. So three days of the feast are gone. They've got four more days. And what do they do? <laughs> well, they do what the Gentiles would usually do. They put the pressure on uh, on, on the source that might reveal the, the meaning of the riddle. Uh, we are now in verse, 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 verse 15 or 16. Oh, my notes always, always just run up and down. Okay, verse 15. And it came to pass on the seventh day. Oh well, time is almost up. They said to Samson's wife, lure your husband so that he may tell the riddle to us, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Oh. That's what the Gentiles do, brethren. They are ruthless. They're ruthless, and I've been warning the house of Israel, you here, and all the house of Israel, of how ruthless they are. And I'm coming back to this verse that I mentioned to you in, in Blessings and Cursings, because uh, there is a lady, Baptist and candidate in Serbia, She, we were reading these Blessings and Cursings one of, these, one of those days, and as we will be reading here that as well, and she said, you know, the verse that kind of got stuck with me was this, If you're not going to, because she's, of course, beset with many trials, you just know Satan always does that to discourage us from getting getting baptized. So she says, when you read read that verse, I just shook and I thought, is that me complaining, being with the rotten attitude, you know, while I'm still having abundance? And uh, God says, if you're not going to serve me with joyful heart, then you're going to go into captivity. She says, that verse got to me. And as soon as she said that, I thought... What about my beloved house of Israel? Who is the leader in complaining about life and everything? It's always the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, of course. Joseph's descendants. They always have something that is wrong with them or, or wrong with whatever. I know that life is not easy, brethren, but um, still there is plenty of abundance. And still there's plenty of room for our joyful hearts, you know. And I thought, well, that verse, I said to her, Vesta, this verse really speaks very much primarily to the house of Israel, so you have no even idea that you've diagnosed their problem. They constantly complain about something. They're constantly unhappy about something. They're not rich enough. They're not. They've not, not, they've not got that brand of the car. They've not got the house. They've not this, this, that, and the other. And yet, they're the richest people in the world. In the world. So, uh, I'm coming back to this, you see. Uh, speaking of Gentiles, there is a difference between Gentiles and, and the house of Israel. So this is what Gentiles do. You would never threaten somebody to burn their house down, right? Would you? Your nation would never do that. And as I mentioned to you last night, I was talking to you the difference between the Gentiles and Israel. Brother, I'm real. I, I, I understand more and more why God put me into this position to tell you the difference. To tell you how ruthless they are. To show to you how ruthless they are. What you would never think about. Gentle mind constructs such an idea that you would you 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 just don't don't even doesn't even cross your mind at all. And you see that's why I realized I said to God, but why why would why will Israel suffer this much? When they're nice people, family people, many honest people, why? Well God says it's their knowledge, Sasha. They know who they are deep down, but they would much rather just you know ignore that knowledge and they want to be Pagans just like all these other nations. And they think they're nothing better than all these other nations, which in a sense they're not, but because they're God's people, they've got certain advantages. But they don't want those advantages, God says to me. Don't you see? See their history throughout the judges. See their history throughout the chronicles and kings. I keep delivering them and they constantly want to go back to be like the other nations. So I'm realizing, brethren, much of your, much of condemnation on this, on the Anglo-Saxon world comes from your knowledge. You've got knowledge, you've got Records about the true history, about the about the Bible, about all, I mean, and I, as I said last night to somebody, if there is nothing else there, if you had no literature, even if you didn't have a Bible available to you, like many people in the world don't still, there is something that testifies about your identity. That something is your heraldry. You cannot you cannot escape that one. You cannot get away from your heraldry, your national symbols, your national anthems. Speak who you are. Look at the English unofficial anthem. Do you know what it is entitled? Jerusalem. You tell me what the Jerusalem has to do with England. Well, much. It was their capital in the old empire under King David. And then you look at the verse, you look at the lyrics. Meek feet of a lamb walked over their land. Oh yeah, it's true, they did. You know, the seafarer was, at that time, there was, the, he was not flying by airplane, but there was his great uncle, 
Joseph of Arimathea was trading with for the Roman benefits with with the British Isles. Tin was very prominent at that time. So of course, being his you know his nephew, should we should we not think that between the age of twelve and thirty he would get Roman citizenship as well and travel with him a little bit, you know? And then there is a house in Gl- uh, Glastonbury, I think. There is a plate on it. This is house of Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus Christ. Is that impossible? No. But something else when you think about it. There was then, by the age he was 12, he spoke at the temple with all those uh, big men, you remember? Because it was the Passover time and his parents all of a sudden lost him. Where is he? And he found him in the temple. Son, what are you doing here? Well, I'm in the house of my father. And imagine that's the mother. We'll speak about his mother a little bit, you know. His mother in the Gospels. Can you just imagine what that woman went through? Knowing all the while who he was. And all the surroundings said, oh, she got, she got pregnant really without sexual, oh no, <laughs> tell it somebody else. <laughs> so she lived with that stigma throughout her life. But anyway, back to Jesus Christ. So, if he traveled to England, to Glastonbury and so on, he obviously knew who they were. What do you think, that he kept quiet about the good news? I wouldn't think so. Which brings us to something else that I never thought of before. Who got the good news first? The house of Israel or the house of Judah? You know, because Israelites tend to so much put so much emphasis on the importance of the house of Judah, which I'm not denying. There's a great importance in the house of Judah. But who got the first news first? And then you hear something else. You hear about American Indians. Some of them speak very similar to, some of their dialects are similar to Hebrew. So no doubt there will be lost Israelites as well. And you hear some legends how there was a white man that came from that holy land, promised land among them, and he told them he was going to die, he had to die, and they tried to convince him, please don't die. <laughs> don't go there. He says, I have to. It's a legend, but I'm asking you, if he went to America, America was discovered much before Columbus anyway, by Vikings, if he went to America as well, among his lost tribe of Israel, again, you tell me, who got the first, the good news? The, tra- the house of Judah or the house of Israel? You know, how, how amazing is the true Bible history? And then he comes in the 30s, he comes to his Judea and then preaches on that Sabbath. Today, in your ears, this, these words have been fulfilled. And boy, they're now wanting to kill him because he is, he is a blasphemous. Interesting is this marvelous is history. I mean, I, I, I yes, I, 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 I admit I'm fired up about the house of Israel. And what concerns me is that I'm seeing, even in the churches of God, brethren, this lack of enthusiasm for the house of Israel because it's supposedly a racist idea. Now you tell me, forgive me for this digression, but I have to tell you this. You tell me, what is racist about that? You've got certain members of the House of Judah and House of Israel that just concentrated in certain areas because they had to fulfill end time prophecies, right? But at the same time, remember Hosea chapter 9 verse 9, that the House of Israel is going to be scattered, it says, into all the nations. If it means into all the nations, that means into all the races as well, right? Right. Just a common sense. So there are all the races, black, yellow, whatever, Indians who have got lost house of Israel among them. That's what the Bible says. In fact, one of your kinsmen, my dear friend Margaret, is an avid researcher of the house of Israel. She has found traces of them in Asia all over the place. And when she talked to somebody, one of those elders there in of those tribes, she, she asked him, how many Israelites might be here in, in, in Asia? Or generally. And I remember she told me, he, he responded, two billion. Why should we be surprised? Because the Abraham seed will be like the star of heaven. Innumerable. Like the sand on that beach that we, we, are, we have been using. We cannot count them. So what is racist about it? All the races. When I was in Africa, everywhere you find name of the motel Samaria. Who in the world would name motel Samaria? You tell me. Then motel Jerusalem, motel this, motel... I'm like, what in the world? And then you go to a congregation in a very, very, very countryside, and here comes the pastor Ezekiel, and says to the congregation, Shalom, Shalom. And they all respond, Shalom, Shalom. And later I asked them, I said, do you know what Shalom, Shalom means? They've got no idea. Where did they get that Shalom, Shalom from? You tell me. They've got no idea what it means. 
You see? So what is racist about the house of Israel? You tell me. There is nothing racist. House of Israel everywhere. Everywhere. But some part of the house of Israel, of which you are part, had to be in certain locations to fulfill certain prophecies. Yeah. Nothing is racist. And the, the, the more people are getting less enthusiastic about, no, I'm just getting fired up more and more. And I see, I, I think I'm being infectious, so some of you are getting fired up now more and more because you see how the true history of, of, of God's people is amazing, is beautiful. And again, all these critics of the House of Israel, they can deny whatever they want, but I'm asking them to explain to me your heraldry, unofficial English anthem, your flags, and especially the Northern Ireland flag. Let them explain that to me if they can get it out somehow out of the context of Israel. Uh, and then Judges 14, 16, Samson's wife, what does, well, what does wife do anyway? Yeah, yeah, wept before him and said, you only hate me. Yeah, there's that manipulation always. You hate me because you don't do, you don't tell me, you know, what you're supposed to tell me. You put forth a riddle to the children of my people and have not told it to me. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father and my mother and shall I tell it to you? <laughs> And she wept, of course, and then he has to tell the riddle what it is. So uh, he loses. Those guys get uh, what they were supposed to get from him, and that's about it. Uh, let's go to chapter 15. And afterwards it came to pass, verse 1, in the days of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I'll go to my wife into the room, but her, uh, but her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I truly thought that you utterly hated her, and I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Please let her be for you instead. Again, Gentile mindset, brethren. I know you're horrified by all this, but why are you horrified by all this? Well, because you've got Israelitish minds, you see. To you it's unfathomable. You cannot even imagine something like that. And I agree with you. I, I understand you. I'm an Israelite myself, now led by the Spirit, just like all of you are. But you're horrified. But this is gentle mind. Red and gentle mind can be ruthless, come up with all kinds of concautions, immoral things, and, and justified. You see, what is justification? Look, this younger is even better, nicer, you know, better looking. Why did you go with her? Terrible way to treat your daughter, but gentle mind, said brethren. That's why I've been telling, yeah, I know it might make, make some of you uneasy. That's why I've been starting to telling you how horrible the, the, the tribulation will be because most of your kinsmen do not understand gentle mindset and, and, and horrors that the gentle mindset is capable of, of, of coming up with. And among the, among, the gen, among the Gentiles, the greatest, one of the greatest pagans are who else but Germans who have given birth to many of the pagan myths and legends and so on. Uh, that's what his father, Samson verse 3 said of them, now I shall be blameless concerning the Philistines in the evil I do to them. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took five brands and turned the, well, strong, mighty man, you know, what was for him to take, you know, three foxes and turned the foxes tail to tail and put a fire brand in the middle between the tails. And when he set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the stocks and also the standing grain with the vineyards and all. So all of their crop was gone. And the Philistines said, who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Gentile mindset again, brethren. And you may wonder, why am I put, why am I underlying this? Brethren, you know why? Because we live in the Laodicean age. And one of the problems of the Laodiceans, I've come to realize, is that they don't really believe the words of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ says that uh, what the Jacob's trouble from uh, Jeremiah 37, it will be the great tribulation, the worst time ever, Israel, the Laodiceans don't really believe it because everything is nice and punky dory and sweet, and you know, and they cannot even imagine something like that happening. But Jesus Christ is very clear; He never lies. But the Laodiceans don't believe Him. You see, oh, it must not be that bad. No, no way that people can be that ruthless and do something like that to the house of Israel. So they're just, you know, lukewarm to the point that Jesus Christ is not even among them. 
He says, pushed out of the, you know, out of their midst, right? And locking on the door, saying, hey, look, Laodiceans, you let me in. I've got something to tell you. And you've got to believe me. And be zealous about it. So I underline these things to you so that you would not become this Laodicean in that sense. You have to understand that there is, you have to understand at least somehow, or through my words, how the Gentile mind works. Gentile mind is just totally different from yours. It has nothing in common with your values, brethren, even with your secular values. It will find every single way how to cheat the system, things that you don't even think about. You know, when Romania and Bulgaria were, were admitted to the, uh, to the European Union, all of a sudden the borders are open so they can go west, go west. They've done so much damage to England because English people cannot even think, of, you know, think things that they did. They found a way how to cheat people when they get cash out of their, out of the machines. They found a way how to, how to work through that system and use the weakness of the system. Things that English people would never think about. I can tell you another example. Denmark, for example. You know, there's some of Serbian diaspora in Denmark, of course. And Serbian diaspora is kind of puzzled. You know, we come and we're good uh, painters, so we tell them, well, we can paint your house with... No, they won't. Because by doing so, they will evade taxes, you see. You see, the mind of Den- Den- Danish people, you know, it's their country, it's their land, we don't want to evade taxes. But look at the Gentile mind. Oh, we can just paint your house, it will be really nice. And don't worry, no taxes to be paid. You see the difference? You realize that those are like oil and water, they really kind of come together, but they can never mix. Verse 8, Judges 18, And he stuck, struck them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and lived on the top of the rock of Etam. And the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah, and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they answered, We have come up to bind Samson, to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of rock Etham and said to Samson, Do you not know what the, that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? And he said to them, As they have done to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, We have come to bind you so that we may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not fail upon me yourselves. And they spoke to him, of course, they they, 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 they bind him then. He came to Lehi, verse 14, and the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords upon his arms became as flax that has been burned with fire, and his bands loose from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of a donkey, and put forth his hand, and took them, took it and killed a thousand men with it. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, Heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking, he threw away the jawbone of, out of his hand and called that place Hill of the Jawbone. And he was very thirsty and called upon the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance into the hands of your servant. And now, you see, he nevertheless still proclaims himself his servant. So he's still aware that he is, he is of God and he is powered by God. And now shall I die with thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And look what happens in verse 19. Have you ever noticed this? But God cut open a hollow place and water came out there. Water came out of the stone. When did that happen in the, in the history of the house of Israel? Yeah, it happened when they left Egypt. And he drank and his spirit came again and he revived. And therefore... He, its name is called Fountain of the Praying One, which is in Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of Philistines 20 years. And comes chapter 16. He goes to Gaza, verse 1, and he saw a harlot there and went into her. You know, a Nazarite going into harlot. <laughs> Terrible. But I have to remind you that the tribe of Dan was known for a kind of... Um, Playing around the truth a little bit. The tribe of Dan was the, 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 the most paganized tribe of all, of all Israel. The tribe of Dan was known for those, uh, bullocks. Remember bullocks were made in Dan and Vassan? The tribe of Dan was the first one to fall for idolatry and eventually led the, the rest of Israel into idolatry. Uh, the tribe of Dan to this day is very idolatrous because Irish people is in our staunch Roman Catholics. Uh, what else about the tribe of Dan? Uh, so they were 
like the first ones to go away from God, you see. So you see this tendency now in, 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 in Samson. Verse 2. The Gazites were told, saying, Samson has come here. And they surrounded him and laid wait for him all night at the gate of the city and were quiet all night, saying, Until the light of the morning, then we shall kill him. And Samson lay until midnight and arose at midnight and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city. <laughs> Just imagine. Just imagine man walking out. There he comes, takes hold. It's, you know what are the gates of the city? If you, you've been to Jerusalem, you've seen the gates. It's like uh, concrete gates. You know, it's not like a uh, little door. No, it's a concrete gate. So you have to kind of, I mean, you need some strength to get that. So man gets the whole gate and the two posts and pick them up with the bar. For everything. <laughs> everything. And, and he says, and carry them up to the top of the hill, that is before Hebron. And afterwards, it came to pass, he loved the woman, so he destroys her with that gate. And then he loves the woman. And here we come to that far, far, wonderful story. Woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, I remember when I was little, there was a, there was a movie on Samson and Delilah. But just to again tell you the, 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 the Gentile mindset. Yeah, the movie was shown, but nobody ever told us, kids in Serbia, that that was actually a story from the Bible. So we thought it was not, you know, just like a fairy tale that people came up with. So we, you know, we were watching the movie thinking, oh, interesting movie, but nobody told us Samson was a Bible hero. Nobody told us that it is from the Bible. Nobody ever told us the Bible was the book of, the book of life for us. Nobody ever told us where it came from. You see, gentle mindset. Gentle mindset. And the Lord's, verse 5, of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Oh, here we come, gentle mindset in action. Lure him and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may prevail against him, so that we may tie him to afflict him, and each one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. And Delilah, of course, begs him, you know, tell me, and, uh, and, and, and he, she tricks him about three times. And we drop to verse 10. And Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may, what, uh, what, with what you may be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me fast with new ropes, another lie, of course, then she takes new ropes and binds him new ropes. That doesn't work, of course. Uh, and let's go now. Um, verse 15, here Gam comes. Women charming manipulation. And she said to him, how can you say I love you and your heart is not with me? Uh, you have mocked me three these three times and have not told me what your great strength lies. And it came to pass because she distressed him with her words daily and urged him, his soul was grieved to death. I shall not ask you married men about this part of the story, actually. <laughs> I'm sure that that grievance to the death is <laughs> something horrendous to go through. But anyway... And it came to pass because she distressed him with her words daily and urged him. His soul was grieved and then he reveals to her where is his strength. The Philistines get hold of him. And uh, that's it. And then we drop to verse 23. So they now imprison him. His eyes are out. They take his eyes out. And he is now, he is now going around and... and, and uh, Serving, what do you call that in English? Uh, well, anyway, he's going around and something is being ground, ground. I think wheat is being, he's grinding wheat anyway. And then we go to Judges 16 verse 23. Then the lords of the Philistines gather in order to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And people saw him and praised their God. For they said, our God has delivered our enemy into our hand and the destroyer of our country who killed many of us. And then when their hearts were merry, it came to pass that they said, call for Samson and he will make sport for us. In Serbian rendering it says, he'll dance for us, you see. Or he'll be like, he'll be like a circus animal, you know, for us, so we can just kind of rejoice over the fact that he's so humiliated and that he cannot harm any of us anymore. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made sport for them, and they sat between the pillars. And Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Allow me to feel the pillars upon which the house stands, so that I may lean upon them. 
Now the house was full of men and women. Now consider there was all aristocrats, all the important big names, you know. And all the lords of the Philistines were there. And upon the roof were about 3,000 men and women who watched while Samson made sport or while he danced. And Samson called to the Lord. Oh, for the first, for the last time, he has remembered nevertheless whose servant he is. He has called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray you, and strengthen me, I pray you, only this once, O oh God, so that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was held up of one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed mightily with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all people in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. And that was that was the end of Samson, brethren. Now, I mentioned to you three lessons we can take out of this incredible story. And, yeah, you feel kind of a little bit down, like the Serbian congregation when I look at them. You know, he was the mightiest man in the world, and he kind of, well, he kind of was a Nazarite. He was born to the glory of God, but he seemed to miserably fail. He fails this miserable death, being, you know, blind and being among the enemy. However, the three lessons we need to learn is this. First one is we are called to a holy life, brethren. Samson was the original superhero. Much better than Tarzan, much better than uh, a Superman. So he was the original hero, superhero. He was the strongest man in the Bible by a long shot. I don't find anyone else who was that strong. And might be the strongest man who ever lived. You see, his birth was sort of a cinematic affair, so we read about it, you see. Samson was miraculously conceived after the angel of the Lord appeared to his barren mother. And his parents were given specific instructions how they should raise a child, and that he'll be Nazarite to God from the womb. And then the angel was talking to his mother, says, you know, don't drink strong wine, don't drink strong drinks, don't eat unclean stuff. So we have very clear instructions that Samson himself was not to drink that was strong, that was wine, and he was not to touch anything that is unclean. So there were specific instructions for Samson by God and how he would be brought up. Now, the demands of sanctity imposed on both Samson and his mother exactly reaffirm that God had incredible plans for Samson's future. They were very clear. So he was consecrated and he became a Nazarite from birth. Now, Nazarite means to be separated, you know, something similar to the word holy or sanctified. And the men and women, as I told you during the, those times or some time of distress or some time of need, uh, during the times of judges, on occasion, you would you would see men and women take this Nazarite vow, but for a certain period of time, you know. It was usually done for a very short period of time. However, Samson's vow was for his entire lifetime. And then if we take apart now the life of Samson, was he a good role model? Uh, we can't say so. He went to Harlow there. He took that honey out of the, you know, he was not really a good role model. You know, the life of Samson is an episode of his stubbornness, disobedience all at once. So he broke his vow, he ate honey out of the carcass of a lion, he was not supposed to eat or touch anything that is unclean, he hosted the week-long parties, which some would find objectionable, but again, it was a, it was, uh, it was, uh, custom in the, in, in, in the house of Israel. The parties were not a problem, but you know, it doesn't say that at those parties he would drink wine, but, Really, would it be very easy to avoid drinking any kind of beer, wine, or whatever if you had, you know, a party like that? So, he obviously drank some wine. He would compromise a little bit here and there, you know. And you see, but unlike him, we are called to live a holy life because God created us for a higher purpose. Please go to Second Corinthians chapter six, verse seventeen, where the Apostle Paul clearly states and reminds us. Second Corinthians six, verse seventeen. The command for us, brethren, is come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is, un what is unclean and I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So God expects us to live a holy life. Our lives should be wholly dedicated to God and his way of life. You certainly know by heart now Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Romans 1 says we must offer our lives as a Living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your, that is our, reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transferred, transformed by the renewing of your, that is our mind, that you, that is we, may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we are called to live a holy life. That's the per- first lesson in the life of Samson. The second one is, who gives us strength, brethren? It is God who gives us strength, indeed. Because otherwise we wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be strong enough to resist the pulls of this world and keep this feast which, as I told you, last seven days. And it's not by a chance, because in the Jewish tradition, seven the wedding feast was held for seven days. You see how it all parallels, you know, what is physical parallels in the spiritual realm, and those two, really, you cannot really separate it, you know. Uh, so God gives us strength. Now, Samson certainly might have been the strongest man in the Bible, but as strong as he was, his strength didn't come exactly by working out at a gym, doing crossfit, pushing rocks, swimming on the swimming on the beaches, or whatever exercise they did during those days. You see, Samson's strength came from God, and you remember in the last very moment he prays to God for that last moment strength, and he gets it. You see, and we have been given an immense strength and God's Holy Spirit. Yeah, so think about that. We've been given that strength and. Though we might not be as strong as Samson physically was, each one of us have our unique strengths and talents that we can use for the glory of God. And as you can see, for the last time, once again, God is giving Australia another chance for the end time work. Yes, you see, we are imperfect, all of us. We kind of mess up a little bit. We get late half an hour. We just adjust this, that, and the other, but we are still here. You know, God is giving Australia and New Ze- sorry, God is giving New Zealand and Australia one last chance in the house of Israel, leading tribe of the house of Israel, one last chance for the end time work. He could have said, forget about it. These people are just too much. Let me go among the Gentiles, because you remember, uh, Paul says, if I went and told Gentiles this, they would have listened to me. No, it was Ezekiel. God says to him, look, I'm sending you to rebellious house. And I know they will not listen to you. But tell them this is the message. If I send you to people who don't speak your language, they will have listened to you. So God has said like, oh, forget about this house of Israel anymore. They're just too stubborn, too rebellious. Forget about this Australia. Forget about that distant New Zealand land there. It's a beautiful land. But you know, those people are stubborn and obstinate. So forget about them. I've got plenty of Gentiles. Look, Asian European continent, Africa, let me work with them. But no, brethren, no. Please understand what is your mission in these land days. God has given Australia, New Zealand and Australia another chance. Another chance. The last one. And if you blow it, brethren, if you blow it, oh well. It is not by might, nor by human strength, but by what? By Zechariah, but my spirit... The work and work in Australia, in New Zealand, in Australia, and everywhere else will be done by God's Spirit. No longer do we need, nor do we have any access or money to go to the big TV screens, to have our posh little tie with ties, our little presenters. No, brethren, you've got this rough Balkan boy here in this shirt, and you've got all of you with all strengths and stuff, and we are going to do the end time work, brethren. Not by our mights, but by the Spirit in us. The time has come for that, for us to realize that. We can no longer hide, as I told you in the story of Gideon, we can no longer hide behind flashy uh, magazines, uh, booklets, whatever. We are doing all of that. And trust me, we are by now by this voice that you're listening is now soon going to be heard even again on the shortwave in the United States. So like Herbert Armstrong did once, we're going to cover the whole United States with the, with the, with the gospel. And we're certainly going to cover one of these days in Australia with that. But brethren, we have to be zealous for that. And this is the last chance given to Australia. To New Zealand and Australia. Keep that in mind. And God has chosen you to be carers of that work. And you'll probably say, well, why me? You know, oh, shall we test God like Gideon did? Oh, do us, do us some miracle. You know, why don't you call 50,000 Australians all at one now? It won't work that way. <laughs> he'll call who he'll call. But you have been chosen for that great time work. Imperfect as you are. Imperfect as Samson was. So, uh, 
We have unique strengths and talents, brethren. We, I, I, I've been trying from the, even before the feast and even now, I've been trying to convince you of the times in which we live. I've been trying to convince you once again that it is a great mercy through you that God is doing to this land and to the land of New Zealand. He could have given up. He knows how rebellious your nations are. He told it Ezekiel. They will not listen to you, but no, don't worry, just go and tell them what it is. And I said to myself as well, well, they won't listen to me probably, but nowhere, no wonder. I'm going to go and tell them because nobody, fewer and fewer people in the world want to tell them their identity and who they are. And fewer and fewer people want to tell them what is in store for them unless they repent. But brethren, it worked. Do you realize that it worked? Somebody phoned you the, the other day and said, I'm listening to that bloke from Europe. There's some Alexander V.E. something, you know. What were the chances? That someone heard my voice. But you know, it's faith, brethren. It's the work by faith. It's no longer worried by flashy magazines and look how imperfect we are now. We'll just, we'll just go, you know, somewhere backwards. We'll just hide behind some big figures, you know, big evangelists. No, it doesn't work that, that way. It worked. And because it worked, we'll continue with this faith, with the Holy Spirit moving forward. So God is giving us another chance for the house of Israel. And they need to hear that message, brethren, because many of them will repent in the Great Tribulation. Many of them will regret that they did not listen to the message when the time was nice and good with abundance, but many of them will, re- will repent. And many of them will have to turn and lead, you'll hear that on the Sabbath, to their land. You see, Israel, do you realize, Israel is the only nation basically in the world. How many nations lost their land? Gentile nations, none. Because Gentile nations were not God's people, you see. And God has left now millennium and the second resurrection for them. But nevertheless, Israel is the only nation that lost its land because of its terrible sinfulness. So Israel is again going to lose all of their lands, present lands, but yet there is still promised land, original, that God wants to bring Israel to. And join them with their brother Judah, and then the two sticks, remember Ezekiel 37, become one. And for the first time, Israel becomes what? Role model for the rest of the world. What a brilliant plan, brother. What a, what a marvelous plan. And you come somebody, and what is even the uh, irony of the world, of life? You have somebody coming to you from a Gentile land and telling you about all of that because all these other Israelites don't seem to be willing to tell you who you are and what is in store for you. But I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is. Because if I don't tell you, Jesus Christ is going to judge me one of these days. And he's going to tell me why haven't you, imperfect as you are, did no, why did, no, did you not tell my people what is written in my word? Well, I'm telling you what is written in his word and, I'm, and I intend to continue doing that. But I'm happy to see that Australia has got another chance. Until yesterday, until before the feast, it seemed that Australia has got only a few, you know, baptism candidates and how are they going to fare? No, brethren, I'm seeing something else and you are seeing something else. I'm seeing formation of Australian congregation. Do you think it's not a miracle? Do you think it's not something? Yeah, I'm seeing. Yeah, I know that you're imperfect and you've got this and this trouble and I know there's not much money and I know that Australian nation is now terribly in debt and I know all that. But we are living by faith and I'm seeing formation of an Australian congregation. Yeah, there'll be not 5,000 of you, but it doesn't matter. There are five of you here, but that's fine. Each one of you, obviously, God thinks that you, each one of you might be valued as 1,000, you know. Think about it. And realize who you are, other than being Israelites. Realize still who you are as God's people. So it doesn't mean, brethren, what age or group or financial status all of you are. Whatever made-up status that man has created, we all have gift from God that is useful for his work. And never think that we are nothing. Don't you ever think about that, because making a contribution to preaching of the gospel of the kingdom like it was in the past is not just making it monetarily, you know. No, we are so poor, we are not really a big upper class of the Australian society, we cannot, no, brethren. It is through our service, our support, network, and building each other up that this work is going to be done. And I feel, perhaps I'm wrong, I feel that with the mightiest work ever done before the end, you know, before the end, how Samson shined, he shone before the end, you know, let me just say, he killed even more than who he killed his life. I think the end time work will be like that. It will be very troublesome, of course, the society will not like us. Nevertheless, 
The light of God's people is going to shine brightly all throughout the earth. And seeing you now and seeing this formation of Australian congregation, I'm sure that your light is going to be the one that is going to shake this nation and that however much they don't like the doctrine, they will have to admit that there is God working with individuals like you and that it is God who is going to deliver one of these days the nation. When they hear the two witnesses, they will not be able to say they didn't know. They'll recognize the message. Oh, they will say, oh, that, that, that fellow called Dick. Oh, that fellow called John. That fellow called Jamie and Roger. And that nice lady, Tanya. They told us all of this. But we didn't listen to it. We thought they were lunatics. But now, they'll have to admit, you were right. And many Laodiceans in your country and elsewhere will have to, before the beast, confess that those two witnesses are God's people, that what we believe was God's doctrine, and that those who escaped into the place of safety are God's people. They'll lose their lives for that, and they'll qualify, therefore, to be the kingdom of God. So nothing is lost. Don't think about your numbers. Nothing is lost, brethren. God has it all under control. Nothing is lost. Even the Laodiceans are not lost. Their, their lamps are about to go out. That's the real translation. But they're not still out. So nothing is lost. And then comes that second exodus. A glorious event written in the Bible. But of course your kids won't tell you about that because, oh well, to them it's negative. What is negative about it? You're going to be brought back into your land. Your original land. You're going to become a role model. And then we can of course come over and clean up Australia and make it a beautiful land once again. Even more beautiful than now. What is negative about it? I don't know. People just have come up with all these crazy ideas. And they won't preach you the Bible too, truly as it is. I have to tell you the Bible as it is, because otherwise, as I tell you, one of these days Christ will ask me, why haven't you preached what you know? What shall I tell him? Oh, there were so nice people in Australia, I didn't want to kind of upset them by the truth. <laughs> well, no, I won't tell him that. I, I'll say I tried my best to preach, and to reach all of Australia with that message, with the help of all of the Australian members who shone with their great light in this nation. So it's not only money, brethren. We are all important in God's eyes, and in the end... We do need God's strength to fulfill our calling. I'm sure you know Philippians 4, 13 by heart. Roger and I had it an ambassador as one of those memory scriptures. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Keep in mind that one. And the third lesson we have from the book of Samson or the story of Samson. Brandon, we have the freedom to choose. But we are not free from the consequences of our choices. Keep that in mind. You're free to, you know, choose, and I'm free to choose, but the consequences will be there. God has given us the freedom to choose life. He says, choose life that you may live, you and your descendants, or please don't choose death. God has in motion an immutable spiritual law, and if we break it, you know, it's like the like the law of gravitation. We might just jump off this community center to fly, but uh, because we don't see the law of gravitation, we don't see the spiritual law either. So we can just jump off that cliff to fly a little bit, and then we'll just be... Smashed. So the spiritual law does exactly the same in our lives. We don't expect spiritual law, it will smash us, you know. It smashes this nation greatly because they don't expect spiritual law. And there is something else when the Israelites ask, especially those in England and Australia, well, what is going on with our country? Well, then I, I quote to them Hosea. One of these days we'll go through Hosea. I said, you have allowed something that the Bible said long ago that you'll do. Foreigners are eating up your power. And I know now these politically correct people say, oh, he's made a racist statement. I didn't make any racist statement. I made a biblical statement. Foreigners are eating up his Ephraim's power. That's what it says in Hosea chapter 12. Go and read it. How do they eat your power? By imposing their values on you. And remember, their minds are Gentile. They're not Israelites. That's why you find it odds with them. Not because you want it, but because it's just like that. They don't want to be Israelites. They want to be Gentiles. <laughs> but you have something else as a problem. You want to be Gentiles as well, that is pagans. You don't want to be God's people, you know. So foreigners are eating slowly your power. And you're like a silly dove. You're just nice people cooing like, like doves. You know how doves cook cooing and, you know, kind of love one another. You're just like silly doves. Ephraim is a silly dove. That's what it says in Hosea. That's not my words. And then some people say, well, do you love your brother? You seem to be so gleeful about God coming and Jesus Christ coming and, and, and uh, sorting all of this out and all of these people who are destroying the earth being put in some other service. Well, you seem to be so gleeful and that's not, well, I'm like, really? Well, no, I said, I'm just fulfilling the word of God. The word of God says rejoice 
Right? When Jesus Christ comes, he says, Rejoice, you heaven and earth, because all these evildoers are conquered. So I'm rejoicing. What shall I be doing? You know, feeling sorry and for them and say, Oh, why don't you God leave them let them live more? So do more evil to this humanity or to this earth. Of course not. So we have to be rational, you know. There, God sometimes He He allows enough time even for the evildoers to repent. But if they don't, what can you do? Judgment for them is there. And it's for our good, brethren. It's for the good of the other humankind. It's good for the good of this planet. We must not become these soft, politically correct, wishy-washy people, you know. That's what destroys everything. And forget about democracy. When we, when we talked about registration of, of this, of this community, I told you, I'm not going to allow you to vote. I've, I've, I've already made my decisions based on what I know to be fair. You all said to me it's fair enough. Great. I asked you, do you think it's fair enough? You said fair enough. Okay. Democracy is the, is the cause of destruction. When you let these foreigners eating your power have their democratic rights to destroy your country, destroy your culture, destroy your system, there you go. I've heard that in America. Somebody told me that in America, mind you, the most democratic supposedly country in the world. Democracy is the, uh, nu- the nucleus, root, whatever, of destruction. So we have freedom, and although God forgives, some choices better that we make can be life-altering. Keep that in mind. And in the case of Samson, losing his strength and his eyes were a devastating blow. He never did recover from it until the last few minutes of his life when he asked God to give him strength one more time so he could fulfill purpose and his calling. You know, he had so much promise, you know, and then you think, oh, what a pity he blew it all up, you know. But, you know, he had very little to show for it at the end. What if he avoided Delilah, for example? You know, we, we ask questions. What if he did? Would his life have been any different? Uh, would his life be any different? Well, think about it. So would his life be different, brethren, if he avoided Delilah? Well, he made some, Samson made some boneheaded decisions in life. He was very flawed in character. We have seen that. He had incredible strength, but also incredible weaknesses. Do you recognize yourselves in that? Yeah, of course you do. But his commendable traits. He accepted his role. Just I'm telling you, accept your role. You're the last chance for Australia, for the gospel to be heard in this country. Don't expect me from over the seas. I'll do my part with my voice. Yes, you see people hear me. When you least expect they will hear me in Australia, but they hear me nevertheless. So I'll do my part, but it's you. Your role is to once again shine brightly and do probably the mightiest yet ever seen work of God in Australia, in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, Samson had trusting faith. We saw that at the very last moment. Please, Lord, give me one more time. I know I, I blew many of them, but please just give me one more time this strength. And he, he killed them more than he did when, during his life. And he was willing... Listen to this one, to work with God. So those three traits, whether you need to have here in Australia, in New Zealand, Australia, and elsewhere, to accomplish the work of God. But Samson had moral flaws. We saw he had lust for women. His sins were the weakness of the flesh. He did not live up to his vow, training, or dedication at all. But nevertheless, the Old Testament, you see, record, contains unvarnished accounts of Samson's sins. Have you realized that? If it was a Gentile mindset, they were all hush, hush, hush up, you know, about their heroes. They would just keep quiet about their, their, their sins and their weaknesses, and they would always exalt their heroes to be something imperfect, something perfect, something untouchable, something untainted by anything. That's what I see in Serbian, you know, in Serbian culture. That's what you'll see in any Gentile culture. But you see, with Samson, there is no attempt in the scripture to conceal all his weaknesses. We have just read them all. There was no attempt to downplay his weaknesses or to exalt his noble traits. His weaknesses mirrored actually the religious and moral climate of the house of Israel as a whole during the time of Judges. As the nation was, so was their hero. But despite of all of that, here is the comforting thought now. Despite of all of his weaknesses, brethren, he did return to God before he died. Didn't we? We, we read that. He did return... God used Samson to fulfill his purpose, and in reality, his death did much more to impede the oppressive actions of the Philistines, because his destruction of the Temple of Dagon was a major factor in their downfall at Mizpah by Samuel and the children of Israel hundred years ago, a hundred years later. 
than this event, you know, because he weakened them so much. They lost so many military leaders. They lost so many of this nobility. They were just now completely dismayed. So 100 years later, uh, a century later, they lose at Mispa. And you'll probably find funny that I named one of my cats Mispa to remind me of how humble and thankful to God I should be because Mispa comes up in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah when Babylonians destroyed all the Judah. And there was only one little place that remained kind of, kind of in one piece. It's called Mispa. And I called one of my cats Mispa because I told him, look, there's, there was a, there are people of Israel who are just slaves rescued from Egypt. God gives them the best land in the world, but they're still ungrateful, you see, and they, in the end, lose everything. So I said, I'm naming you Mispa so that I'd be always reminded how thankful I have to be to God for all that he has given me. And perhaps the greatest lesson that we can learn from all of this, brethren, and keep that lesson in mind, is that God forgives is that God forgives, and there are other lessons that we can certainly learn from Samson, but especially you young people in terms of relationships. He did not listen to wise counsel, especially from his parents. Samson lacked self-discipline. He was a poor judge of character. He didn't know that looks are deceiving, and he ignored obvious red flags, you know. There his wife trying to kind of get out of him that truth, and he should not have ignored, but he did. Samson was strong, but he was also weak in many areas. His strength ended up being his demise at the very end because he relied on himself way too much. His relationships, if we take a look at them, were plainly mess. Mess. Total mess. He ruined his life. He suffered greatly because of it. If we were to encapsulate his life, it would be by these words. He was blinded by his own strength. Who is blinded by its own strength in the Bible? You'll remember, is the Laodicean church. Oh, we're so strong, we're so knowledgeable, we don't need anything. Oh, Jesus Christ, yeah, we know him, but he's somewhere there, you know, out of the door, he's knocking, oh, somebody's knocking on the door, oh, it must be. Oh, Christ is not among us, it must be. Oh, the tribulation is now here, Christ is, there must be him. Open quickly the door so he can rescue us, but oh well. So the fire in, in, uh, through uh, the gold being refined in fire, they'll be rescued, but nevertheless, they will be. However, Samson was the strongest man ever to live, but it was God who gave him strength, and more importantly, Samson let himself be used by God, you see. And only at the very end, when he finally learned to trust and obey, he did redeem himself. But then keep that in mind. We'll see him in the first resurrection. Because... In conclusion, just like Samson, we are called to live a holy life. We are to be separate from the world. If God who gives us strength and real strength comes only from God, and although we are free to choose, we are not free from the consequences of our actions, Samson's life and reputation might have been tarnished at the end. But in the final analysis, God saw Samson again as a man of faith. Because, as you know, we have the evidence right there in Hebrews chapter 11. He is listed in the whole of Faith. He's listed in the Hall of Faith, and we read through the list of names recorded there. You'll realize that there are some very imperfect people right there, from Gideon and Samson. All the well, you might say, well, what about Abraham? Well, remember how Abraham lied twice about his wife to save his life, and so on. So you know, you have all of these big patriots who did some terrible mistakes. But my question for you at this end is: now that you know that Samson made it which means we can also make it. How about you and me? Are we leading holy lives? Are we asking God for strength? Are we asking God to help us make good choices in life? And more importantly, brethren, on our spiritual side, have we slain any Philistines lately? 